Our next speaker is an Oxford-bound Harvard senior. Please welcome to the stage, Rhodes Scholar Tanya Fabo. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Tanya Fabo. I'm a current student at Harvard. Um, I just want to start off by, you know, thanking, you know, Mary and Cecilia and everyone at the Ad Club for inviting me here, um, and also to thank you guys for coming to hear me speak. Um, my parents are in the audience as well. I haven't actually told them what I'm talking about, so <laughs> they're hoping I don't say anything too crazy. Um, <laughs> so. Today I want to talk to you guys about something that is, you know, incredibly important and personal to me, and that is diversity in STEM. Uh, so, a bit of background about me. I was born in Germany. I actually moved here when I was seven years old, um, and my entire family is Cameroonian. Um, and there's this really old stereotype about African immigrants always wanting their children to be either doctors or lawyers. Um, and so very early on, my parents kind of just recognized the fact that I really love science and they pushed me in the doctor um, scientist direction. <laughs> um, and you know, they did do a lot early on to really academically push me. Um, like in third grade, they had me doing academic workbooks for fifth graders. Um, they had me watching like science channel documentaries before I went and watched like Totally Spot on current network um, <laughs> and my parents are actually both also like very scientific oriented and so it was just kind of natural for me to go into the sciences um, there's actually this really funny story uh, when I was in sixth grade I actually first moved to uh, Mystic Valley which is where I would end up staying for the entirety of high school um, and when I came there, they actually placed me in like the very lowest math class. This was after I'd been in like a gifted program the year before. And so my mom basically like marched up to the school and was like, no, this is not happening. Um, and she like forced them to let me take a math placement exam so that I could move up. And then like I kept, kept moving up. Um, and like by the end of the year, I was in basically the uh, second highest math class. And the only reason I wasn't in the first math class was because they'd started me off at the lowest math class. Um, so my point with this being basically that you know, academically, math and science haven't ever really been a challenge for me. Um, and especially in middle school, I kind of just like cruised academically. Um, but in high school, things kind of really started changing. Um, so I mean, for those of you who, you know, remember high school or maybe are still in high school, um, it's a very interesting time of like raging emotions and insecurity. Um, and for me, a lot of that insecurity came from the fact that there really was something different about me. Um, you know, every, in every single one of the classes that I was in, uh, especially the advanced science and math classes, there was something about me that stood out. Um, and that was the fact that, you know, oftentimes I really was the only black person, um, often the only black woman in a lot of those classes. And it wasn't that there weren't, you know, black people at that school, it was just that once you got to the classes that I existed in, you know, that diversity kind of just stopped. And for me, especially in high school, I didn't really want to stand out all that much. You know, I really wanted to blend in with everyone. And the way for me to navigate those spaces, the way for me to navigate that difference was by shrinking myself and by shrinking my identity and by shrinking my abilities. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of high school friends that kind of told me that, you know, I wasn't really black, like I was the Oreo, like the, person, the, the black kid who's basically white on the inside. Um, and I mean, I believed it, you know, I, at that point, I wasn't comfortable enough in my own blackness to stand firmly in it. And so, you know, I kind of believed that I wasn't really a black kid, that there was something different about me. Um, and obviously it didn't help either that the way in which, you know, the high school curriculum is kind of organized. Um, like the only time that I was really learning about black people was in the context of like slavery and Jim Crow segregation and in all of my science classes I was learning about like Gregor Mendel and Isaac Newton and all these white men who basically have ruled science for ages. Um, and so that was, it was hard because in high school especially I kind of had to mentally dissociate myself from blackness in order to be comfortable with the spaces that I was inhabiting. Um, but things kind of started to change uh, when I came to Harvard. So it was really when I came to Harvard for the first time that I started to recognize the diversity of black excellence that exists. 
and it's also where I became a lot more comfortable with my own blackness, uh, with my own identity as a black woman. Um, and it was really where I started to proclaim that as part of my identity. Um, but this kind of was a double-edged sword because you know, as I was becoming more comfortable in my identity as a black woman, it's also when I started to really recognize the issues of representation that existed within STEM, even at an institution, I guess especially at an institution like Harvard. Um, and it was, it was hard and it was different from, you know, what I'd felt when I was in high school because in high school, I was kind of mentally dissociating myself from it. Whereas now, you know, here I am comfortable in my blackness, but it's also when I really started to realize that that blackness that I was comfortable in, that womanhood that I was comfortable in, wasn't something that was necessarily welcome in those spaces, um, in classrooms that were predominantly white, um, that were taught by predominantly white teachers. I mean, for example, I've taken, what, like 18 science classes at Harvard so far. Uh, two of them have been taught by women, and two of them have been taught by people of color. Like, <laughs> like that, that's not okay. Um, and I've, I mean, I've never had a science class that was taught by someone who was underrepresented in STEM, or an under, underrepresented minority in STEM. And so, for me, sort of at my lowest moment, I was really, at my lowest moments, I was really starting to question, you know, what it was about this field that I, you know, that I love, that I'd loved since I was a child. What was it about it that wasn't welcoming to people who look like me? Um, and you know, at my lowest moments, I really wondered, is there something wrong with me? Um, is there something wrong with my identity that doesn't necessarily lend itself to future success in STEM? Um, and yeah, I mean, it was difficult. And you know, a lot of this self-doubt and you know, doubt about my future within sciences, especially early on, really silenced me in a lot of those classrooms. So you know, maybe I'd have something to contribute to whatever the teacher was saying. Um, but I just wouldn't say anything because I didn't want to risk looking, you know, dumber than I already felt by being a black woman within those spaces. Um, but after, you know, a lot of introspection, um, I started to realize that there isn't anything fundamentally wrong with me. Uh, there isn't anything fundamentally wrong with minorities and women who want to go into this field. It's that there is something fundamentally wrong with the field itself, um, and that is, you know, how can you have an entire field where basically half the population, if not more, is com almost completely excluded from it? Um, and, you know, when I started thinking about this and the fact that there is a real issue with representation within sciences, that's kind of where my work started uh, when I was at Harvard. Um, so there's this idea that I like to turn to. Um, it's this term called envisionment. Um, it was described by the sociologist named Dalton Conley um, as the simple familiarity with and demystification of certain social roles that is afforded to those in privileged positions. And so basically what it's saying is that if you do occupy you know, a privileged status within society, it's a lot easier for you to imagine yourself in certain esteemed social roles compared to people who don't have those who look like them within those roles. And, you know, that's minorities and that's women, especially, you know, in regards to the STEM field. Um, and it is, I mean, it's easy to blame the lack of diversity in STEM on minorities and women and say, you know, maybe if they just went into this field, you know, issues of representation would be solved. Um, but human beings are, you know, these inherently visual creatures. And it's hard for us to picture our futures when there is no example for us of what that future looks like. Um, and so my charge, especially throughout college, has really been to tackle a lot of these issues of representation. And so for me, um, like last year, for example, I was president of the Harvard Society of Black Scientists and Engineers. Um, and so with this group, I worked a lot with um, under I <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. God, it's great to be in such an affirming space. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, and so with this organization, I worked a lot with underrepresented minorities in college to start, um, you know, organizing panels and mixers and talks and basically anything that could expose them to, you know, the few people who actually exist in the field who look like them um, to really allow them to see themselves within these roles. And I also, you know, recognizing the fact that a lot of these structural forces that 
prevent the entry of minorities and women in STEM, either implicitly or explicitly, start very early on. I also organized the uh, Albert Einstein Science Conference for Advancing Women and Minorities in STEM, which is basically a K through 12 conference for um, kids who are in the Boston Cambridge area, allowing them to come to Harvard. And it was a conference that we organized with a lot of other minority and female STEM groups on campus, um, allowing these kids not just you know, to conduct science, but also to conduct science alongside people who look like them so that they can see this future as something they themselves can potentially inhabit in the future. Um, but at some point, I had to also think to myself, you know, what is the real point of diversity in STEM? Because, I mean, if you really want to play devil's advocate, you could say that as long as, you know, the same scientific knowledge is being produced, then it doesn't really matter who's doing the science. It's all about, you know, objective scientific truth. Um, and how, I mean, how are you supposed to convince the people who do currently dominate this field that there is a need for diversity if you can't convince them um, of the reasons why uh, the scientific truth that would ultimately be produced is different. And so I guess my, like, my big point is that diversity in STEM is what is going to fundamentally change the scientific knowledge that we produce. Um, and so I guess just, in, just as an example, um, we could go back to you know, the 1800s um, where scientific racism was a really big thing. Um, there's this idea called polygenism, which is, I mean, completely unfactual, uh, but it was basically the idea that uh, races are, or different races are basically different biological species. Um, and this idea was, I mean, it was supported by some pretty premier scientists. If you think about like Louis Agassiz, for example, whose name is plastered all across Harvard. Um, I mean, he was a pretty big polygenist. Um, and there's also a physician named Samuel George Merton who also supported this idea um, and who actually used like the cranial capacity of different races um, to try to support the fact that you know certain races are genetically superior to other races. Um, and then I mean even beyond like polygenism, you have like uh, J. Marion Sims, for example, who's kind of termed like the father of modern gynecology. Um, he practiced a lot of his gynecological techniques on the bodies of black women um, and didn't even use anesthesia on them. Like, I mean, these were horrible surgeries and he didn't use anesthesia on them because he said that black women couldn't feel pain. Um, and these women obviously were later also denied the ability to benefit from the techniques that had been practiced on their bodies. Um, you have, I mean, I, I could go on forever. Um, 1900s, for example, you guys probably know about the Tuskegee syphilis trial, um, where black men were denied penicillin for their syphilis because scientists wanted to observe like the natural progression of um, syphilis. I mean, I could could I could go on, but my point is that the social society and the social inevitably have a way of seeping into the production of scientific knowledge. Um, and I guess you could say that, you know, these examples of scientific racism are really extreme and, you know, no longer really relevant today. Um, but I mean, even today, scientists are still trying to, like, essentialize race, which is a, bio, uh, which is a social construct, essentialize it in the form of geographic human genomic data. Um, and I mean, this extends beyond race, too. Like, there is this um, sociologist named Emily Martin uh, who talked a lot about, or who wrote a lot about how scientists, especially like within biology textbooks, um, characterize reproduction in the form of eggs and sperm. Um, it's, it's actually really funny. I'm gonna try to find a quote for you guys. Um, so, she, she, so she wrote a lot about how sperm is described very differently from eggs within scientific textbooks, um, where <laughs> sperm is described with you know, velocity and accomplishing a great feat and whiplash-like motion and strong lurches, um, you know, where the egg, on the other hand, is passive and drifting, basically waiting to be fertilized by the sperm. Um, so I mean, basically, societal culture is literally 
is literally shaping how biological scientists are discovering or are describing what they discover in the natural world. Um, and so what that tells me is that there's no such thing as scientific, objective, scientific objectivity. Um, there's no objective scientific truth because no matter who's doing the science, we're all inherently social beings and the science that we do is going to be inherently influenced by a society. Um, but that's not necessarily my problem. I mean, you can't tell human beings to be asocial in order to you know, do scientific research. My problem is that the scientific research that is being done has been done predominantly by white men. Um, and there's no way to get to the whole scientific truth in a field that is dominated by only part of the population. Um, And so I guess, sort of to close, like in trying to answer this large, larger question that I posed at the beginning, what is the point of diversity of STEM? Um, the point is that diversity in STEM is able to shift the lens with which we are viewing scientific knowledge and its production into one that is more inclusive of this world's identities. Uh, I mean, do you think that the role of the egg would have been so downplayed if there were women who were working right along those scientists? I don't think so. Um, do you think that if black scientists early on had been there to challenge people like J. Marion Sims that any of that would have happened? Like I, there's, for me, there's no way that any of these major transgressions that I just talked about would have happened if there was greater diversity in STEM. And even thinking about you know, women like Katherine Johnson outside of biology, which is my field and probably why I focus so much on it, but even thinking outside of that, you know, women like Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson who were featured um, in the film Hidden Figures, um, thinking about the incredible work that they did, the calculations that they did that contribute to a lot of major NASA missions, such as sending John Glenn into space, um, or thinking about Sabrina Pastorsky, um, who is a current Harvard PhD candidate, um, a Cuban-American woman, who's been hailed as the next Einstein for her physics work. Um, I mean, the voices of those underrepresented in sciences, and in any field for that matter, are not just there for good looks and to check diversity boxes and to meet quotas, it's that our lived experiences inherently shape the way we think and the way we approach scientific problems. And so how can we expect to capture the full, scientific, the full spectrum of scientific knowledge when there's only a portion of the population that's actually being represented in the sciences? There is, I mean, there's so much, to me, there is so much untapped scientific knowledge in the world and so many brilliant scientific minds that are being limited by a lot of the institutional and structural forces that are preventing their entry into the sciences. You know, explicit forces like underfunding of public schools in underserved areas or implicit forces like the issues of envisionment that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so if we're ever going to capture this full spectrum of scientific knowledge, all this untapped potential, we need to do something to really address the lack of diversity that currently exists in the sciences. Um, and so that's really the message that I try to keep with myself every day. You know, anytime I doubt myself, anytime I'm about to raise my hand, but then don't raise my hand in um, a lot of the classrooms that I'm in. Um, it's, I really think about the fact that I'm not just here to check a box. I'm here because my voice inherently matters and because the things that I say are going to fundamentally change and improve the way that knowledge is produced. Um, and even you know, as I advance in my career and hopefully have the opportunity to mentor a lot of students who will by that time probably still be underrepresented within the sciences, it's something that I'll tell them. You know, it's that my voice matters and that all of our voices matter um, and that it's only through our voices being heard and respected for all that they're worth that science, a field that I still love and still care about so much and want to see, really want to see flourish, it's only through all of our voices being heard that science can be used to change the world to better the lives of everyone. Thank you.